Good morning and welcome to the 24th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone please in the public gallery to switch your electronic devices to silent? Thank you. Item number one is decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take items four, five, six and seven in private this morning? Thank you. Item two is section 22 reports, the 17-18 audit of NHS Ayrshire and Arran and the 2017-18 audit of NHS Highland. I'd like to welcome our witnesses today, Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, Lee Johnson, Senior Manager, Performance and Best Value, Audit Scotland, Joanne Brown, Director Grant Thornton, UK LLP, and Pat Kenny, Director of Deloitte LLP. Can I invite the Auditor General, please, to make a short opening statement? Thank you, Convener. The first report this morning concerns financial pressures in NHS Ayrshire and Arran. The external auditor gave an unqualified opinion on the 2017 accounts for the board, but it is facing significant financial and performance challenges. In 2017-18, it needed £23 million of brokerage from the Scottish Government to achieve financial balance. At the beginning of the year, the Board's potential deficit was £13.2 million, but this increased during the year to £23 million. The Board faces an extremely challenging position in 2018-19 and beyond. It's projecting a deficit of £22.4 million in 2018-19, the current financial year, with an additional £13 million in 2019-20 before projecting a balanced budget in 2020-21. An external review of the Board's approach to efficiency and transformation concluded that its current plans are not substantial enough to achieve long-term financial sustainability. NHS Ayrshire and Arran will find it difficult to address the financial and performance challenges it faces and to implement the recommendations of the external review, and this represents a significant leadership challenge. Moving on to the second report, this highlights financial pressures in NHS Highland. Again, the auditor gave an unqualified opinion on the accounts, but she reported on the scale of challenges the board faces in achieving financial balance. In 2017-18, the Board did deliver £35 million worth of savings, but it still required brokerage of £15 million. It faces an extremely challenging position in 2018-19 and beyond. It's identified that it needs to make £52 million worth of savings in the current financial year. So far, savings of £30 million have been identified, leaving a funding gap of £22 million. NHS Highland plans to produce a longer-term recovery plan, underpinned by a more detailed operational plan setting out new models of care within the Highlands, and it's engaged the help of external consultants. Stable leadership will be needed to implement the plans, and I anticipate that the Board's financial position will deteriorate before the underlying issues are addressed and performance improves. The Chief Executive leaves the Board at the end of December and the Director of Finance is acting on an interim basis. This obviously creates risks around the future leadership of the Board. I'm joined by Pat Kenny from Deloitte, who's the appointed auditor for NHS Ayrshire and Arran, Joanne Brown from Grant Thornton, who is the appointed auditor for NHS Highland, and Lee Johnston from Audit Scotland, and together we'll do our best to answer the Committee's questions. Thank you very much, Auditor General. I'm going to ask Willie Coffey to open questioning for the Committee. Thanks very much, Jenny. Good morning, Caroline. Uh, I wonder if I could ask a few questions relating to the Ayrshire and Arran report and situation. Uh, as you said yourself, and uh, which has been well covered, the brokerage amounts in the past couple of years have been pretty substantial. Uh, and your report preceded the Cabinet Secretary's announcement that these would be written off, not just for Ayrshire and Arran, but for all the health boards who received brokerage over the last five years, which is very welcome. But I, I wanted to try initially to explore what some of the reasons may be behind that overspend. I don't think for a minute convener that that kind of level of expenditure wasn't required to deliver, to deliver health care to the citizens of Ayrshire and Anne, but I'd like to try and understand what the main reasons behind that substantial overspend may be. Um, I'll make a couple of points and then ask Pat Ken Kenny to come in. Um, the first, Mr Coffey, you referred to the Cabinet Secretary about the uh, announcement about writing off brokerage. Um, that's obviously welcome for the boards affected. It's worth noting that for both of the boards I'm reporting on this morning, their financial projections don't include any provision for repayment, so it doesn't change the position that I've brought to the Committee's attention today. Um, and secondly, you're absolutely right that um, every board is uh, trying to balance the need to manage its financial 
targets, its activity targets um, for things like waiting times and the quality of patient care. And that's very much why the challenges are so difficult to resolve. Pat, can I ask you to talk through the financial reasons for the overspend last year? Sure, yeah. Um, the, the board actually went into the financial year with a, an estimated deficit of ar around £13 million. And that, that was due to underlying financial pressures, overspending and acute um, um, a reliance on um, local and agency bank personnel, that sort of thing. So there was an underlying financial pressure of £13 million, and that increased to £23 million during the year. The main reason for that was... Um, um, uh, additional demand. Um, uh, the, the board were assuming certain um, beds would be closed during the course of the year, but that wasn't um, possible due to the demand on the board, and that that resulted in another 6.3 million overspend. The, the cost, the nursing costs associated with that, and um, keeping those beds open, and the, the, the balance of the, the overspend came from a, a failure to deliver assumed efficiency savings during the year. So that gets you to the, the 23 million brokerage figure. I mean, we, we know that Ayrshire and Aaron's health indicators are not as good as the rest of Scotland. So what I'm trying to get at here is there, is there something particularly unique about this overspend in Ayrshire and Aaron? that we're perhaps not seeing in the rest of Scotland in terms of these demands and so on and so forth? Um, I think I'd say um, from our work across the NHS in Scotland is that all boards are facing significant financial pressures for very understandable reasons about um, demographic change and ageing population and the increasing demand that brings. Um, but each board tends to have a different combination of factors which is uh, causing its specific local challenges. Um, as Pat says, the uh, board had made um, its budget uh, dependent on assumptions about the ability to close some beds. In practice, those beds were needed to meet the demand for unscheduled care um, and the other savings pre provided difficult to achieve in practice. Every board will have its own set of circumstances. Um, there will be three Section 22 reports on NHS boards this year where those uh, challenges have resulted in the need for brokerage. But the report I published last week on the NHS as a whole showed that all boards are struggling with balancing those three bits of the triangle. Uh, finances, waiting times and the quality of care. In, in terms of expecting uh, Yashir and Aaron and indeed any other health board to, to deliver in the transformation agenda, how much of that do you think that they actually control themselves and are able to deliver themselves? As we know, there's three local councils that make up the health board authority, North, East and South, Ayrshire, and if you look at some of the factors like um, delayed discharge, you'll see quite a variable pattern there within the local authorities that make up the health board. So my question is, how much can they really affect change themselves and how much are they relying on their partners within the local authorities to, to make that effort to get performance up? There's no doubt at all that um, tackling this um, in every health board depends on the whole health and social care system working well, um, and the integration joint boards are increasingly important in doing that. Pat, is there anything you want to say about the specifics in Esher and Aaron? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's a combination of both factors, really, um, to, de to de deliver the savings required. I mean, at the integrated joint board level, um, the three councils... Um, I, I, I'm the auditor for those um, the, the IGIB and the councils as well in Ayrshire, so they are making some good progress in terms of um, moving some care from the acute to community um, and there, there, there have been some excellent examples in the health and social care space of improvements in, in care at home and, um, and things like that and end of life care is another good example where they're making really good progress but I think there's still a long way to go in moving the services from the acute to the community side. I think there's a feeling, certainly, from the health board, health board perspective, that the community sector is not resilient enough yet to absorb the demand that it needs to, to allow the, the, you know, the, the efficiencies in the acute side to be made. Is it fair to say that any health board doesn't completely have control over this agenda? It's indeed, they're indeed reliant on the local authorities playing their part to... The, the health and social care system does depend on health boards and local authorities working well together. Um, we're publishing a report in a few weeks' time on progress with the integration authorities, um, but actually I think the, the bigger um, challenge is the whole uh, prevention agenda and the way in which we're helping people to grow older and remaining healthy rather than needing um, support for long periods of their lives as they get older. 
My last query, convener, you mentioned the staff agency and locum costs were quite substantial, but coming down the way there's, there's been quite a, a, a consistent problem attracting uh, NHS staff to come in and to work in NHS Ayrshire and Arran, and the price of that is that you pay higher fees uh, for agency and locum costs that I think Alec Neil raised at the committee before. Are you aware of any work going on nationally that's, that, that, to, to try and help us to reduce that dependency and that high cost on this particular cost factor that hits this health board and, and others? Um, at a national level, it has been a big focus for the Scottish Government. Um, and in the report I published last week, we saw that agency costs, while still high, had reduced slightly in 2017-18. Lee, do you want to say something about the work that's going on at a national level there? Uh, yes, uh, there, I guess there, there is work going on to try and attract people. And I think we'll, we'll hear from Highland. It's another uh, big issue uh, for them. Um, but the, the Scottish Government are undertaking a number of uh, different programmes of work to try and attract staff. Um, the LIFT programme, for example, is relatively new um, about how we encourage people um, to come in and, and take on more senior levels, as, as um, both of these um, reports uh, allude to. That, you know, leadership is another challenge as well as uh, the staff that are dealing. But a lot of the boards have a focus on reducing um, their their staffing costs because it's one of the things that they can have. Um, they can, you know, can try to reduce, if you like, in, over a period of time. They can only do it if they're successfully recruiting locally, though, I would presume. And there needs, there's an issue there about our inability or the problems of recruiting locally to deliver the service. There is. I mean, we know that the workforce at a national level is under pressure. We're seeing increasing difficulties recruiting, some very long-term vacancies, rising turnover, rising sickness absence, which is another indicator of strain on the workforce. Um, I think we're starting to see some improvements in national workforce planning to, to deal with that. Um, and at the other end of the, the um, problem, the short-term issues, um, looking at uh, making better use of locum staff rather than agency staff who tend to be more expensive and less familiar with local health services. But it's certainly one of those areas that's a significant problem where there's no quick fix to it. It will take time to resolve. OK, thank you. Happy to let other colleagues in now, Jenny. Thank you. If I can pick up on one of the points that Mr Coffey raised on workforce planning and training, one of my concerns in terms of workforce planning in the NHS is the training of nurses. And of course, this relates back to how many nurses we are training and how many Scottish domiciled nurses we are training in terms of the places that are available to them and places that are available to uh, nursing students from overseas who perhaps are more likely to return to their home countries to, to nurse there. Did your audits look at whether the Scottish Government is actually training enough Scottish domiciled nurses? Do we have enough nurse training places for Scottish domiciled students who are more likely to work in our NHS hospitals? We have a programme of work looking at workforce planning because of its importance to, to the NHS and the health and social care system more widely. Um, I don't think we've got the, the detail in front of us uh, today, but we can certainly refer back to that um, after the meeting convener. In broad terms, we found that there is a need for improvement in um, the workforce planning that's required, and particularly in looking at the demand side of the equation. Um, the first report that we produced, I think, found that um, the numbers of staff being trained tends to be very much the numbers needed to replace staff who were likely to retire and leave the service in other ways, whereas we know that demand is increasing and that changing models of care mean we need different types of staff in different places. So we have reported on that, but it's not contained within the reports we've got here today. And Lee Johnson, do you want to add to that? Um, okay, can I ask you a specific question then? I mean, you talked about the uplift programme that the Scottish Government the has... Lift. Lift, lift, sorry, lift programme. Program, to encourage people. Yes. Surely the best form of encouragement by the government is to make training places available for people who want to nurse in our NHS. So in the analysis you did of these programmes to encourage more mm. people to work in our NHS. Mm. Did you do an analysis of actual places available? Uh, no, we, we, we haven't done that. I know that I think the RCN are looking at this, this issue. Um, I think what we do recommend in our, um, the NHS in Scotland report that we published recently is that there uh, needs to be more work uh, around workforce planning. Um, you know, the, the, um, the, the Scottish Government have recently 
published uh, three workforce plans, um, but I think at a local level uh, there needs to be more work around uh, the planning and actually how they're going to recruit people and, and um, as you say, uh, train people for the future. But that's a long-term undertaking. That's not... How much are they spending on this lift programme? I don't have that. Okay. Those details it seems here, to me it, that you can spend as much money as you want encouraging people if you don't make the training places available. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a bit of a waste of money. But anyway, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, General, I'm looking at uh, paragraph 26 here where it says that uh, NHS Ayrshire and Arn, after discussions with the Scottish Government in June 2017, uh, had to work with an external partner to review the board's approach to efficiency and transformation, and that was PwC. Then there was further discussions in early 2018, which resulted in the appointment of an improvement director. And yet, if I look at paragraph 23, you're saying that currently, currently, a lack of attention is being given to detailed medium to long-term financial planning by the board. That doesn't sound too good. I think um, what's underlying those two paragraphs is, uh, first of all, the board's recognition and the support from the Scottish Government to try to get to grips with the challenges that they're facing. Um, and secondly, um, a, a theme which is common to my reporting on the NHS, that the uh, very urgent nature of the short-term problems they're facing is getting in the way of their ability to think about the longer-term picture and what's needed to deal with that. Um, Pat will be able to talk you through the specifics that he's seeing in Esher and Aaron, I think. Yeah, um, what we were looking for there was a, a linkage between the, the medium and long-term financial planning and the transformational planning. Um, obviously for the transformation to be successful or to deliver the targets that it needed to, the two would have to be compatible. And what we found during the course of the audit was that I think given the short-term pressures that the board was under, there was definitely a deficit in terms of medium and long-term financial planning and those, those plans were just not available to the auditors at the time of the audit. But looking at this, I mean, j just... Looking at the, the, the bare bones of the report here, it doesn't sound like the board has actually had a grip of this situation. I think they, they recognise the scale of the situation and they're very focused on the immediate actions they need to take to um, halt the decline we're seeing in performance and, and financial, uh, the financial position. Um, but there's no doubt that it will be very challenging for them to make the changes that are required um, at the same time as continuing to deliver services. Didn't happen overnight. No, um, and I've been reporting since I, uh, since 2012 about the uh, danger that the focus on short-term targets is obscuring the underlying pressures which are facing all health boards, including NHS Ayrshire and Arran. But looking at this, I mean, they've got an improvement director in place. What is the improvement director's uh, remit? That. Um, it's basically um, um, to turn around the, you know, the financial performance of the board to implement the transformational change required to, to enable the board to, do, um, to operate within its financial envelope. Um, I, I believe that the director has got significant experience of similar type work in other parts of the health sector, um, and that is the remit, basically, as I understand it. But if I'm looking at uh, some of the reasons here that have been given for the overspend, and this is touching on something Willie Coffey was talking about. Uh, on paragraph 19, page 8, it's uh, talking about a key factor is the older age profile and high levels of deprivation in the Ayrshire and Arne population. Now, that isn't going to go away. So how are they going to be able to bring in these changes that paragraph, sorry to keep referring to paragraphs, but paragraph 17, how are they going to be able to to affect these changes? I think the underlying solution to the challenges at NHS Ayrshire and Aaron and right across the NHS are about changing the way that services are provided. That's absolutely in line with the government's 2020 vision for providing much more health and social care in people's homes or closer to their homes um, and avoiding unnecessary admissions, um, making it uh, easier for people to be discharged quickly if they do need to be admitted to hospital. Um, the problem is that we're not seeing progress happening quickly enough on that, uh, partly because of the continuing focus on short-term financial targets and on uh, the local uh, development plan targets, which tend to be for 
aspects of the acute services like waiting times um, for uh, elective treatment or A&E waiting times. Um, what I've been recommending for some time is that boards need to find the space to pull back to look at the way the overall system works to understand what uh, services are being provided in the community and the impact they're having and to rebalance the system to meet the needs of a population that is ageing. As you say, that's not going to change. But looking Again, just looking at the report, it seems to me that for, this problem has been there for some years. The board, by your own, uh, by your own uh, statement here in paragraph 23, has not been really addressing it. Uh, the government seems to me to have stepped in, uh, just put, and put a bit of pressure on them, and put someone in place to help them along with this, which is not wrong. But it seems to me that this has been allowed to go on for quite some time and the board's not been addressing the problems. Is there not a mechanism, better mechanism for picking this up and for making sure that these boards get the support they should? I, do, I don't think um, the board is alone in the challenges that it faces. Um, you've got two boards um, being reported on today facing similar problems. The committee is very well aware of the challenges that NHS Tayside has faced in um, achieving financial balance. And my report last week on the NHS as a whole showed that the whole system is facing similar pressures um, with both financial performance and performance on things like waiting times declining. Um, the underlying reason for that is the, the ageing population that we have in Scotland and the changing types of care that we all need um, as, as we get older. Um, the signs, I think, of that pressure have been uh, visible, um, certainly for the time that I've been in this job. I welcome the fact that the government is now trying to make space for that longer-term view. Um, we've seen some announcements from the Cabinet Secretary over the last few weeks um, that are uh, demonstrating the um, uh, commitment to making a bit of breathing space to tackle the underlying challenges. Um, but you're right, they're not new issues, and I've been reporting on them for some time now. Alec Neil. Auditor General, you mentioned earlier <coughs> that there are pressures right across the system in every board, although we're focusing in this morning on Ayrshire and Highland. Um, we have, if you add up now the number of partnership boards we have and the number of NHS boards we have, plus the three regional structures that are being created, have been created, that's a total of 56 different organisations, each with their own board, each with their own chief executive, many of whom are in film star salaries, uh, and each with their own structure of finance director, you know, all that kind of stuff. Is the time not come, given the financial pressures, to be looking at the massive overhead that is involved in having 56 different organisations delivering health and social care in Scotland? And that's without including the 32 councils. <coughs> I don't want to veer into the territory covered by my report on the NHS published last week, which I know the committee will be considering soon. Um, but one of the themes in that report was very much um, the uh, growing complexity of the governance of the health and social care system in Scotland and the risks that poses to people's ability, first of all, to get the right leaders in place um, to do what's needed across Scotland, and secondly, to be clear who's accountable for what and therefore what progress we're making. Yeah, so we can discuss those when we're discussing your latest report. But it, it's quite interesting, Highland is the only uh, part of Scotland where the single agency model for the delivery of health and social care, where there's only one board delivering, as opposed to the 31 partnerships elsewhere. Um, now, although Highland has got clearly financial pressures, um, is there any evidence so far that the single agency model is better or worse at delivering uh, health and social care according to plan? Uh, that's a very good question and one we're considering as we finalise our report on health and social care integration which is due for publication in the next few weeks. Um, I think what I'd say at this stage is that it's clear from the report on NHS Highland that, it's, that, that the lead agency model isn't a panacea, um, that there are still financial pressures in both the health board and the council. Um, the ability to deal with those is constrained by the different accountabilities that those bodies have and the financial pressures that they're facing more widely um, and I think um, it's something we're watching closely to see how it develops. I'll check if Lee or Joe want to add anything to that at this stage. I think from my perspective that's, that's fair and as the 
NHS Highland report outlines that NHS Highland are facing challenges around adult social care and the financial sustainability of that and some challenges around that relationship and working with the council through the lead agency model. So whilst they can demonstrate some good outcomes from that model, there are underlying challenges within that and how the governance of that operates for them. Okay. Can I go back to just both Ayrshire and Highland and indeed other boards then? I mean, I think one of the issues is, and you mentioned this specifically in relation to Ayrshire, is one of the causes of the current problems is underestimation of the demand uh, for services, in particular for acute services. Uh, and that's one of the reasons, for example, why the 100 beds weren't closed down and so on. Is there not a need overall to improve? And you know, in this day and age, we we know the size of the population in every area, we know uh, the complexities that are likely to be faced, and they are changing. But nevertheless, we have got a good idea. We know the age structure of the population. We know historical demand. You know, we can predict actually very accurately uh, the number of people likely to be seen at an A and E department day by day. Should we not be, as a starting point for a lot of this, not getting a far better handle and a more professional, systematic approach to demand forecasting? I think we are seeing some progress on that, and I'll ask Lee to talk in a moment about what we understand of the work the government has underway. Um, I think there is another dimension to it as well. Um, this committee has heard a lot about optimism bias, particularly in relation to things like IT projects. I think the focus on financial targets and waiting, time, waiting times targets means that there is a degree of optimism bias in board's financial planning as well, that they tend to make assumptions that they will be able to achieve savings that in practice are very difficult to achieve. And I think both both, part, both sides of that equation need to be tackled. Lee, do you want to say a bit about demand planning? Um, yes, so the, the, there, is, there is work um, under, uh, being undertaken to try and uh, plan better. Um, but I think it's also, um, we have to think about it in the context of integration as well and, and moving more care into the community. Um, so I think there is a hope that as you know, we go into the future that there will be less unscheduled care um, and I think the, the other thing that the government would point to this year is also the winter pressures and uh, that does reoccur every year but I think it was a particularly bad winter um, this year as well which obviously probably had an impact on Ayrshire and Aaron as well. Just a final question, <coughs> are we sure <coughs> that this is overspend or were they allocated a budget that was too low in the first place? I mean, Willie Coffey referred, for example, to the economic social profile of Ayrshire, uh, which is one of the poorest uh, counties in, in Scotland. Uh, and, and obviously, as we know, demand for health <coughs> and social care is driven by levels of poverty and deprivation to a large extent. So um, is, is this really overspend or is it underfunding in the first place? Um, and my second very specific question on Ayrshire is, um, as in the Lothians, which is another health board in, in trouble, um, the chief executive of Ayrshire and the health board doubles up as the chief executive of the west of Scotland region. Does that not send out, send out the wrong message? I mean, with the current situation in Ayrshire, should the chief executive not be full time on Ayrshire and Arm? Um, I will uh, start off answering both of those. Pat may want to come in um, to, to add to it. First of all, on the question of whether the budget as a whole is sufficient. Um, health boards are funded, as you will know better than anybody in the room, I think, Mr Neil, on the basis of a, a national formula uh, which aims to take account of uh, the makeup of the population, its age, uh, composition, deprivation and so on. And the government has been making r more rapid progress towards making sure everybody achieves their national resource allocation um, formula funding. Um, as I say in the report that was published last week, the government has succeeded across a period of time um, in keeping the funding of the health service very slightly ahead of inflation. Um, but when you look at it on a per capita basis, um, it tends to lag inflation. And we know that healthcare costs increase more quickly than inflation as a whole, and the population is ageing. So there's no doubt that the budget for the health service as a whole is under pressure. And in my view, it's probably not possible simply to buy our way out of the challenges we're facing here. The, the answer really is in reshaping the way care is provided to meet the needs of an ageing population. Um, the second point I'd make on the leadership um, examples that you touched on, um, I think that is uh, another feature of the complexity of the uh, structures we're seeing now in the health service, the number of bodies that are involved. 
compounded by the difficulties that the health service is having in attracting um, chief executives in the number and of the quality that are needed to do the work. Um, my report on NHS Highland highlights that the chief exec there, exec there will leave by the end of the year. We know that a number of other uh, very experienced and senior chief executives have also indicated their intention to leave or to retire, um, and that pressure on leadership is only going to get worse. For me, that's one of the reasons for looking at the way in which the NHS is governed and structured to make sure we're making the best use of the leadership that is there. Pat, did you want to add to that? Yeah, and the only thing I would add to that is that I, th I think the, um, at Ayrshire and Arran, as I think in, in most other boards in Scotland, there's been limited progress in moving the set aside budget for acute services into the community sector. And I think um, effectively that is where the biggest bang for the buck would be in terms of improvement overall. And I think that that has been, um, um, there's been very limited progress. And I think if there could be more progress in that movement in the set aside budget, that could really have an impact on the ground. Be useful just to explain what the set aside budget is. Yeah, the, the set aside budget was basically the provision at the, the, the time in terms of the health and social care partnerships been formed that was um, set aside for acute services with the, the objective of over a period of time moving it f to the community sector. Ian Gray. Thanks. I, 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 well, Mr General, I want to follow on, to, uh, follow on from the answer that you just gave uh, Alec Neil around the difficulty of finding leadership with the capacity to address some of these uh, some of these problems, as you pointed out, um, in Ayrshire and Arran, the chief executives leaving, the finance directors leaving, we've seen similar issues, for example, in Tayside. Um, and it, it, in your answer to Mr Neil, you said we can't buy our way out of the problems. We have to change how we deliver um, health and social care. But you've also said on a number of occasions that the difficulty these two boards and other boards are facing is the balance between um, demand, the need for the level of activity and performance that we want to see, and uh, balancing the books and the finances. Uh, is it not just the case that there simply isn't enough money in the health service to do the things that we want it to do? Uh, first of all, for the record, it's the chief exec of NHS Highland who's due to leave Sorry. rather than Ed Sheeran, just for the record. Yeah. But your point still holds. Um, I, I think um, I need to be careful here because it it, it clearly is a, a question of significant government policy. What I would say, though, is that 42% of the Scottish government's overall budget already is spent on the NHS. Um, that has risen as a proportion over recent years. Um, and uh, the, uh, the, the challenge of meeting the, the immediate demand for health service means that there's probably been no alternative to doing that. But if we keep on doing it, it will squeeze out the ability to spend on any other public services, including equally important ones like education and the things that um, will set Scotland up as, as a country um, that can thrive in the future, uh, whatever the constitutional arrangements might be. Um, and secondly, I think that there is very good evidence that continuing to meet demand as it um, ships up at the hospital's door isn't the best way of providing care for older people. Um, there's very good evidence that we will uh, treat the people of Scotland much better if we are providing much more care in the community in people's homes and close to homes that keep them well for as long as possible and support them at home for as long as possible um, so that they're only admitted to hospital when that's what's best for them and can go home as quickly as possible and that access for younger people who do have more acute needs that can be treated and cured, if you like, um, is not slowed down by the number of older people who have no alternative but to be admitted to hospital. So for me, it, it's not just a, a matter of whether we should be shoveling more money into the health service. Of course, the health service is a vital um, part of society. Um, but if we don't change the way we provide services, the uh, demands will swamp the other public services that are equally important. Um, and it's not the best way of looking after people either. But if I understand um, some of your, your previous comments around transforming the way in which we deliver services, you've talked about having to create the space in order to make that change. Uh, and my question really is about leadership rather than finances. So we've seen um, in Highland 
uh, two two of the senior uh, managers leaving. We saw in Tayside really the whole senior management move um, in boards as well. We've seen problems. The report says in Highland there's been a significant turnover of um, non-executive directors on the board. The question I'm really asking is, are we asking those in leadership positions in our health service to do something which is just simply impossible? And that's why um, they're leaving and we can't find replacement. In my view, um, the uh, very narrow focus that that has been in the past on um, short-term targets like achieving in-year financial balance and achieving the local development plan standards has tended to focus people on the short term in ways that will run faster and faster and faster to try and keep up, and that's clearly becoming impossible. So I think there is a link. Um, I welcome the announcement the Cabinet Secretary has made about a medium-term financial framework for the NHS and for um, thinking about where the uh, local development plan standards fit into that context. I think that will buy some breathing space to make the sorts of changes that will genuinely address the underlying um, challenges here. Um, and it's something that I think the committee may want to explore with the government about how they intend to use that space to build leadership capacity to make sure that we're not that we're spending the capacity we have on the right things and that the governance is clear enough and strong enough to deliver what's needed in practice. Okay, I mean, on uh, the leadership point still, um, Mr Neil spoke about the number of chief executives that the current system requires, um, and I think the phrase he used was film star salaries. But actually, in the Highland report, um, you point out that uh, there's been a doubling in the number of clinicians there earning over £200,000 and that two clinicians are now earning £400,000 per annum each. Is there a problem in the salary structure within the clinical side of the NHS, not just the governance side? I think it's important to say that um, while uh, chief executives are uh, highly paid members of staff, they're also doing very demanding jobs, as you said. Um, and I don't think I'd recognise the phrase film star salaries personally. Um, moving on to clinical salaries, um, they are obviously vital to running the health service. And I think in Highland what we're seeing is very much an effect of the difficulties in recruiting and retaining people in remote and rural areas to provide services. I'll ask Joanne and Lee if they can um, give you a bit more detail about what's happening there. Jo. So in, in terms of those two individuals there that we recognise in paragraph 21, they, that also links to NHS Highlands wider challenges around agency and locum costs. And those two specifically relate to providing suitable, clinical, safe and effective care within Caithness and the Belford Hospital area, so areas out with Inverness. And that, that's been challenging for NHS Highland across a remote and rural area and looking at where those service provisions are, recognising the acute services are based within Ragmore and how can they use then locum and agencies to provide the care that's required in these outlying hospital sites. So, so I'm sorry, I don't... I'm not sure I understand. Are we saying that these two clinicians earning over £400,000 a year are earning that because they're temporary staff on some kind of an inflated um, remuneration rather than permanent staff of the, the board? In those two instances, they're agency locum staff, um, and it's reflecting of the specialist skills that are required, the nature of the clinical specialisms alongside the location and where they're based. So in terms of some of NHS Highlands, outlying hospital sites, there's a requirement there for 24 care and access to a clinical specialist on that basis. So that relates to the need to provide that service. I'm still not sure I quite understand why somebody's been paid £400,000 because they're working in Keith Ness. So it's to do, it is to do with the specialisty, specialism that they provide that under the contracts and the nature of the clinical services and the nature of the pay arrangements in place, that is an ongoing increasing cost for okay, NHS so the nurses Ireland. who are working in Caithness, who presumably also are working in a rural area, are they also being paid twice as much as the nurses in Rigmore? 
I don't actually have that information to hand, and I think it does depend on whether it's an agency or it's locum, and then the nature of the clinical specialism and where that nurse is based as part of their employment contract. Okay. Thanks. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning. Uh, Auditor General, you talked about certain measures that have been taken in the last few weeks, uh, and one of those is that all outstanding brokerage will be written off by the end of 2019, uh, which of course sounds very welcome. But first of all, uh, what is the practical impact? Can you help me out with the practical impact of that? If, as you said in your opening statement, there was no provision made to pay this back anyway? Two boards that um, are in front of you today, the financial projections that I've reported to you don't include any plans to repay the brokerage that they've received so far. So their financial position, as, as they're forecasting at this stage, remains um, as challenging up to 2020-21 um, as it did before that announcement. Um, there is a small number of boards whose financial plans do include the provision uh, to repay brokerage over a period. Um, of those, I think NHS 24 is the most significant. Um, and for those boards, it obviously will provide them with a welcome breathing space um, to uh, look at the um, their financial forecasting more generally and how they can use the resources available to them. But for these boards, it will make no difference to their financial forecasts as they currently stand. I'll come back to that last point you made in a second, if I may. But uh, first of all, just looking at the report, it sounds as though, OK, all the brokerage is written off, but it looks as though for Escher and Aaron, uh, it's all just going to be racked up again. Uh, and your report indicates that the board is, in, is anticipating it, it will require a further 22.4 million uh, in 2018-19, uh, but that hinges upon certain high-risk savings being achieved. Uh, so is it your understanding, given this potential write-off, uh, that irrespective of how much brokerage is on the books by the end of 2018-19, it will all be written off. I think it's fair to say we're not yet sure. Um, Lee, do you want to say a little bit more about the range of announcements that we've heard recently? Yes, so we, we had the, the, obviously the financial framework uh, was published um, and now boards have the ability to plan um, over three years to break even after three years and also uh, to have a 1% flexibility within those plans. Um, other than that, we don't have much more detail. We don't know what that means in practice. We are in the process of working through the framework um, and trying to understand what that will mean in practice for these boards, as I'm sure the boards will be looking at their, their forward planning to, and trying to understand what that will mean for them. But we really don't have details about what that means in practice. Mm -hmm. Well, looking at the forward planning, then, if I may, say in paragraph 21 that the figures that are being projected are based on the board achieving £26.1 million pounds worth of savings, uh, of which I think £9.7 million has either not been identified yet or is identified as, as high risk, uh, so, so may well not happen. Do you think, given this announcement, which I do accept on paper, looks very welcome, uh, but presumably when they're doing the forward planning, Lee Johnson... Uh, there's a risk that the board won't strive in quite the same way to achieve those £26.1 million pounds worth of savings because they know the brokerage is going to be written off anyway. Um, I, I, the brokerage will be written off um, in 2019, but I think it, it, the, the, fine, the announcements don't um, address the underlying uh, issue. But they, as I said, we are trying to understand what the, the three-year break-even and the 1% flexibility means in practice. I think and until we um, have a better understanding of that, we won't know what that means for what the, the board have said to date in terms of what they're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, one question just on something you said earlier, Auditor General. So, some, some boards do have plans to repay their brokerage. Uh, Something that the point was raised when we looked at the college sector and education and how financial planning has been done. Do you think, I'm hesitant on using the word fairness here, uh, but do you think there is any concern that those boards that have 
made significant sacrifices, shall we say, made significant plans to repay the brokerage, will look at this situation and say, we've cut our cloth very carefully, uh, and now we're being penalised for that. Uh, I'm sure those boards will feel uh, slightly hard done by in the way that you describe. Um, I think my concern um, is probably twofold. First of all, I think th these are steps towards um, the longer term financial planning um, that I've been recommending uh, since I've been in this job and I welcome them. Um, but I think it's important that that long term planning is done in a way which doesn't undermine incentives for good financial management. Um, and that the space is really used to address the underlying challenges, as Lee was describing, um, that the uh, demand pressures are only going to keep on increasing, healthcare costs are going to keep increasing faster than uh, the Scottish Government's resources are likely to, um, and these are only useful measures if they are um, building a bit of breathing space for people to tackle the underlying changes that are required and as I said in my report last week to really work with local people um, to involve them in pl planning health services that are more sustainable and better for the future for an ageing population. Uh, final thing for me on Ayrshire and Aaron is the your report indicates that only 60% of savings were achieved by uh, in 2017-18 were on a recurring basis. Uh, how does that compare with uh, recurring savings that are being achieved by other boards throughout Scotland? Uh, and is 60% sustainable, or what is the percentage that ideally you would be looking for them to achieve? I'm racking my brains and I'm not sure if um, Lee can help me. The report that we published last week contained that information for all of the health boards across Scotland. I think that 60% is actually probably um, higher than the average. Um, and Pat's nodding, I'll ask him to come in in a moment. The challenge is that the higher the level of non-recurring savings, the more the board is back to square one at the beginning of the next financial years and having to look at ways of um, reducing costs and potentially cutting services to be able to balance its budget. We know that's getting harder for all boards each year um, and it, it simply isn't a sustainable way of delivering health services for the longer term. Pat, do you want to comment on Ayrshire and Aaron? Yeah, just to confirm that I think based on the boards that I audit, 60% is, is probably above average, just to confirm that. Um, but I think there are generally a, a, a problem throughout the sector that... Um, um, of an over-reliance and non-recurring savings, and I, I certainly find that at the boards that I um, audit. Thank you. Bill Bowman. Yeah, you. Convener, no, morning. In paragraph three of your Ayrshire and Aaron report, you explain a little bit about the brokerage, and then you say what it is, a form of loan funding known as brokerage, arranged based on assurance from the board that it can repay the brokerage over an agreed period. I think what we've heard today is they can't repay this brokerage. What, what is the value of an assurance from this board? Um, the uh, uh, arrangement in place until the Cabinet Secretary's recent announcement was that it was an agreement between the Scottish Government and the Health Board based on that assurance. Um, I've been reporting uh, for a number of years now that health boards in general aren't doing enough in the, in the form of long-term financial planning, um, and I think that places those assurances in question, as you're highlighting. And how does that affect the rest of your audit when you take representations from the board? Um, both Joe and um, Pat will, and every health board auditor, will be looking at the going concern question in the specific circumstances of their boards. Um, I think they're looking at both the assurance around the narrow question of brokerage, but also the um, wider uh, quality of financial management and planning, and the assurances that the government is providing about their uh, commitment to continuing to fund health services into the future in doing that. Um, but clearly it's a more difficult judgment in boards like this where brokerage is involved than it is in other boards. It's more than just the going concern, it's if, if they will give an assurance that is blatantly not, not correct. Um, well, what about the Scottish Government side then? They're, they're providing money without testing this assurance? Um, I think they are uh, they are testing the assurance and in both of the boards that are reported on today you're seeing the measures that they are putting in place to um, help to make the assurances more robust 
by providing support for the changes that are needed. Um, but in general terms, I've been reporting for a number of years that the focus has been too much on achieving uh, in-year financial balance and not enough on really making sure that the longer-term plans are robust and that they're tested. I think the two boards you're seeing today are a symptom of that. We come back to the governance issues that we've raised before. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Jen, I'd like to explore a wee bit more about workforce planning because it comes up in both reports and touched on it slightly earlier. My question is, are we training enough doctors and nurses who are likely to stay and work in our NHS hospitals in Scotland? I heard of a young doctor recently qualified in Scotland, paid for by the Scottish taxpayer to train right through university in our NHS hospital, going off to take a job in New Zealand. Is she likely to come back? It's anyone's guess. I've heard, and I can't substantiate this figure, that up to 40% of doctors that we pay to train here in Scotland leave for Australia and New Zealand. One, is that a good use of public money? And two, are we training enough healthcare staff that are likely to stay and work in our NHS? You're absolutely right to identify the problems. We published a report um, for the committee about a year ago looking at workforce planning in the acute uh, sector of the health service. Um, and it ident identified a number of problems around both the planning for the workforce that we need and the training um, that's underway, particularly given um, on the one hand the time it takes to train professionals of the quality and standard we need, and secondly, the other demands that are making it harder to retain them. Um, I don't have the detail of that in front of me today, but I'm very happy to write to the committee to follow up your questions from there. Um, it is a very significant issue, um, and it's one of the things which is increasing not just the pressures on the services that we all experience as patients, but also increasing the pressure on the staff who are currently working in the health service and adding to the capacity challenges that we refer to in all of our reports on the NHS. Sorry, did you just say that you're preparing a report specifically on that, whether we are... No, we published it about 12 months ago, I think, right. on okay. workforce planning in the acute sector. Yes, OK, so yes. we can refer back to that. My um, second question is around prescribing. Now, you identify prescribing in both the Section 22 reports that are in front of us this morning, and you also identified it in previous Tayside reports. Um, in Ayrshire and Arran, you identify GP prescribing costs. In Highland, you say there's brokerage required for 2.8 million of prescribing costs. C can you tell us a wee bit more about why there is pres pressure on prescribing costs at the moment? Um, it, again, it's a factor which um, is affecting the NHS right across Scotland, not just in these two boards. Um, I think there are um, at least two factors in there. The first is that um, with an ageing population, as people get older, they tend to have a range of different conditions which all um, can be treated um, with uh, medication. So you end up with people having a number of different medications which are, repeat, which are prescribed on a recurring basis for them, which increases costs. And secondly, we have um, new drugs becoming available to treat conditions that previously weren't treated before or to treat them more effectively, and they're often more expensive than the previous approaches to treating them. So the combination of the volume and the cost of the medications um, means that we see increases in uh, prescribing costs and drug costs, which are much higher than the increases in the funding that's available for the health service as a whole. That's not something which affects just Scotland, it's something which is um, prevalent right across the developed world. There are factors in some boards which mean that their prescribing rates tend to be higher than in other boards. Um, that is, as you say, a factor in NHS Tayside. Um, and I'll ask Pat and Joanne if there's anything they want to add in a moment in these areas. But it is an overarching problem um, for the NHS as a whole. Jo, anything you want to add? Just, just to follow up in terms of NHS Highland, um, similar to Tayside, their prescribing rates are slightly higher than the rest of the NHS in Scotland. That's something that they're looking at as part of their financial sustainability plans. They're looking at how certain of those costs can be contained and they're working very closely with GPs and clinicians to understand the nature of that prescribing. And that's something they're going to look at and factor into their financial plans. I mean, the bit you said at the end there, Ms Brown, really intrigues me because I think what we're getting to is a case where we're asking GPs to think twice before prescribing basic drugs. Auditor General, does that not undermine the government's policy of free prescriptions? Um, 
It's very difficult to um, comment on specific circumstances. We're auditors, not clinicians. We've done work in the past on prescribing costs, um, which shows that there are significant variations across Scotland in the patterns of prescribing for some common drugs. Um, and it's not always clear that that is accounted for by the makeup of the population in terms of um, age and sex or by deprivation levels. Um, the government and health boards have done a lot of work locally uh, to address that. For example, we know that the rate of prescription of generic drugs has increased significantly, um, which generally means that patients are getting the drugs they need at a lower cost to the health service. Um, but I think it's because of the scale of the cost of drugs to the NHS um, and because of the rate at which it's increasing, that's not an area where um, either government or health boards should be complacent, I think. Thank you. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. <clears throat> uh, just very briefly, at paragraph 22 uh, of your report, you talk about areas where savings will require to be made by Ayrshire and Aaron specifically. Uh, two of those are closing unfunded beds uh, and workforce costs. So the question begged, of course, is if the Health Board do that, then what is the impact on the quality of care? And what is the attendant impact on the ability of Ayrshire and Arran to meet national targets and standards? To be clear, the um, reference in paragraph 22 isn't to what I think the board should be uh, targeting for its savings, but to their planned mm -hmm. savings. And I'll ask Pat to talk about the process they've been through in identifying those savings. Yeah, um, yes, these are the savings that they are, they are working towards. Um, um, I mean, I think they, they are relying, obviously, the closing unfunded beds um, is relying on the, um, you know, the, the health the, the so health and social care, the community sector, resilience factor. So there is a, a risk factor attached to that. And the workforce costs are, um, I think, are homing in on the agency locum elements of the cost to try and drive down costs there. So I think the, these are the actions that they're trying to take to, to uh, reduce the costs in these certain areas. What impact does that have? It, presumably when they're doing that analysis, yeah. they say, OK, this strips cost out of the system. Yeah. But they presumably also factor in uh, something that says, what is the practical impact on patient care, for example? Has that been done? I, th I think in when, they, when they look at these things, and this is back to the, um, the, the, the rationale, the, the 6.2 million that I referred to in the report, that the, 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 the community sector wasn't ready to absorb that, and, and so the, the demands... They weren't, they weren't, the board weren't able to close the beds they initially had anticipated just because of excess demand. So I think they do look at that carefully when um, in terms of the impact. And they'll obviously only close the beds when they, they feel it's safe to do so. I mean, I've had several conversations with the chief exec at the board, and that is that he, he doesn't, in many respects, he, he, he as I said earlier, he doesn't feel the community sector is re ready and and resilient enough to absorb that demand and that's why he thinks that the board aren't, can't safely close, close those beds at that particular time. Forgive me Pat Kenny if I may just press you, I didn't quite sure. follow, I understood the point you were making. Yeah. Uh, I think you said the chief executive can't close the beds at this time because yeah. the social care sector is not ready to pick up yeah. what it needs to. But then I look back at the report and they seem to have identified that they have to close those beds to make the savings. Yeah. So it, it sounds as though they're going to do something in the full knowledge that the social care sector is not ready to pick up the slack. Uh, am, I, am I hearing you correctly? Or? No, no, I think that they're making that assumption on, on, the, ba the, on the basis of certain respects and targeted areas that they, they can close the bed safely. But um, obviously sometimes... Um, um, you know what, what they were expecting to happen won't happen on the ground, and, and the demand is not is still there, so they can't safely close the beds. So I think that there is that consideration is obviously made, but I think they'll, they'll obviously only close the beds when it's feel it's when they feel it's absolutely safe to do so, which is obviously the right thing to do. Thank you. Do members have any further questions for our witnesses on these reports? Yes, Alec Neil. Uh, you, you said, uh, Mr Kenny, about the set-aside monies, and that's not just the Ayrshire Lamb, it's in many of the other boards as well. Um, when, when we 
they were emptying the Victorian uh, so-called asylums many years ago. There was bridge funding for health boards so that, because there is a period, a transition period during which you have to run in parallel existing services until they're run down and start up and provide parallel services in the community. And that bridge funding, I think, was regarded as a major uh, part of this infrastructure in making the transformation in mental health from these Victorian institutions to care in the community. The fact that the set aside money is that not is not being set aside effectively is that not indicative of the need for some kind of bridge funding uh, as we transfer people from treatment in the acute sector to treatment in the community? I think it's a very good question. I think it's one of the questions the government should be considering as it develops its medium-term financial framework for the health service, particularly given the financial and service pressures we're seeing on health boards right across Scotland, not just in these two. Okay. Colin Beattie. Uh, just a couple of questions on the NHS Highland. Um, on uh, P uh, we pages, uh, paragraph 25, uh, it says here the board commissioned an external independent review of governance arrangements. It seems that this hiring of consultants and so on is almost a reflex when the boards get into these difficulties. NHS Tayside did it, uh, Ayrshire and Arne did it, uh, NHS Highland did it. How much is this costing? The review of governance um, had no um, financial cost attached to it. It, it was an initiative that was started off by the health board chief executives working with the government um, to commission almost a peer review process of governance. And the review was led by the uh, chair of Greater Glasgow and Clyde, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Um, both boards have, um, at the same time, received some uh, consultancy support for their transformation plans, um, which is referenced in the two reports, um, but that doesn't apply to the governance review that you've highlighted in your question, Mr Beattie. Is there a pattern of uh, consultant costs arising from these situations where, you know, by reflex almost they reach out and bring in an external consultant? I would say it's not by reflex. Um, our sense is that the Scottish Government um, has been increasingly aware of the uh, pressures that health boards are under, and as the, they have demonstrated they're unable to deliver their plans, the Health Board has worked with them to bring in support for transformation. Um, as long as that's done well, I welcome it. I think often uh, people think the hard work is done when a plan has been produced. Um, and of course, its success depends on the quality of the plan and the quality of the implementation. Um, so I'm not against the use of consultants per se, but I think it does need to be managed well and to demonstrate good value for money. Just briefly, I'm just looking at exhibit two on page seven of the report, and it details the reasons why brokerage was needed. These seem to be exactly the same reasons that we looked at previously in this committee when we actually went up to Inverness and, uh, and uh, met with the board and so on. I mean, Rigmore Hospital, it was a problem, problem then, it seems to be a problem now. They don't seem to, they don't seem to have got a grip of that. Can you, say, can you say that in terms of the struggling to recruit sufficiently skilled staff, there seemed to be evidence last time round that they were actually managing the vacancies to try and create cost savings. Is there, is there evidence of that again? Um, starting at the beginning of your question, you're right, I produced a report back in 2013-14 on NHS Highland and some of the cost pressures were very similar to the ones we're seeing now. Um, I think NHS Highland is interesting in that it appeared to be making progress in dealing with those cost pressures. It was able to deliver financial balance in a couple of years um, and then the position has worsened again and I think that reinforces the point that these are underlying pressures rather than simply poor financial management. Um, as Joanne has said, um, the, the particular workforce challenges in NHS Highland are definitely exacerbated by the fact that they are as remote and rural as they are and normal uh, ways of providing services that we um, are used to in more urban areas simply don't work well here. Um, the uh, progress they're being able to make in finding sustainable ways of providing those services that reduce the need to rely on locum staff, whether from agencies or banks, um, I think is getting more difficult uh, given the workforce challenges that they're seeing. Um, the number of vacancies is going up and in order to continue delivering services, they're having to rely on agency staff in some areas. And lastly, just to put my mind at rest, 
the, the governance around the board, I presume that there's no issues with that because last time we had problems with governance in terms of the, the way the board operated. I presume at this time that's transparent and uh, above board. I say in my report that the financial reporting to the board is much better this time. The problems were being signalled to the board and the discussions about the need for brokerage were uh, held properly um, and in good time, which is a, a contrast to the last report I made. Um, that's not to say there aren't some governance challenges. You referred to the review of governance and that identifies some areas for improvement. Um, and as my report says, the chief executive will be leaving at the end of the year and the director of finance is acting on an interim basis. So there are, there are challenges in, in that sense to the governance of the board. Any further questions from members on these health reports? Okay. Can I thank the witnesses very much for your evidence this morning? I'm going to suspend just for two minutes to allow a changeover of witnesses. Thank you. Item three is the section 22 report of the 2017-18 audit of Scottish Government consolidated accounts. And I'd like to welcome our witnesses today, Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, Stephen Boyle, Assistant Director, and Michael Oliphant, Senior Audit Manager of Audit Scotland. Can I ask the Auditor General to make an opening statement, please? Thank you, Convener. As the committee knows, the Scottish Parliament has new responsibilities for taxes, borrowing and social security. The changes enhance the Scottish Government's ability to manage its spending, but they also introduce more complexity and risk. This increases the importance of comprehensive, clear and consistent financial reporting to support this committee and the wider Parliament in your vital scrutiny role. The annual consolidated accounts are a critical component of the government's accountability to Parliament and the public. They cover around 90% of the spending approved by Parliament in 2017-18. My independent opinion on the consolidated accounts is unqualified. I'm content that they provide a true and fair view of the government's finances and that they meet the legal and accounting requirements. I'd like to highlight, though, for the committee three areas from my report. First of all, financial management. The government managed its budget for 2017-18 within the overall limit set by Parliament, and budget management was effective. The government borrowed its full annual capital limit of £450 million, in line with plans outlined by ministers as part of the 2017-18 budget. At the end of the financial year, the government had net capital borrowings of £1.036 billion, around 35% of the overall £3 billion cap. 
the government still needs to finalise the policies and principles within which it will manage its new borrowing powers. This is important to support decision-making about the level, type and timing of borrowing and to avoid excess borrowing and associated interest costs. The government has taken, significant, has taken policy decisions to provide significant financial support to private companies, which inevitably increases its exposure to risk. My report highlights the need for more transparency about its approach to supporting private companies. Although business cases were clear for the loans provided to two companies during 2017-18, there is no framework to, to guide support of this kind. This should cover issues like financial capacity, risk tolerance and the expected outcomes, and it would provide Parliament with better information and greater assurance. Secondly, financial reporting. The government's improved its financial reporting this year through its first medium-term financial strategy and fiscal framework outturn report. Both play important roles in the Parliament's new budget process and will develop further over time. However, the use of capital borrowing powers for the first time in 2017-18 reinforces the need for the government to improve the reporting of its overall financial position, as I've recommended before. There's currently no appropriate audited account that sets out all of the government's assets and liabilities, including borrowing by Scottish ministers. This would imp provide important information about the impact of past decisions on future budgets and potential risks to financial sustainability. The government has committed to producing a consolidated account covering the whole public sector in Scotland, but it's now overdue. Thirdly, performance reporting. The performance report inclu included in the consolidated accounts complies with reporting requirements and the account's direction, but the accounts still do not report on the performance of individual portfolios or the Scottish Government as a whole to the outcomes it's seeking to achieve. There's a need for more detailed and transparent performance reporting, linking spending with outcomes in line with the Parliament's new budget process. Convening my report on the 2017-18 Consolidated Accounts is intended to support parliamentary scrutiny of the government's finances. It provides assurance and it also identifies a number of areas for further improvement. As always, we'll do our best to answer the committee's questions. Thank you very much indeed, Auditor General. I'm going to ask Ian Gray to ask the first question. Thanks, Convener. <clears throat> I wanted to ask a lot more about the uh, second of the um, newer elements of the consolidated accounts that you referred to, Auditor General, which was the um, support to private companies through the provision of loan finance and so on. And um, you say, <coughs> excuse me, in the report and reiterated this in your open, opening remarks, that the publicly available information about the extent of these loans is very limited. Um, uh, and one of the reasons the Scottish Government has um, uh, argued uh, they, they have to limit what's, what's available in terms of information as commercial confidentiality. And I just wanted to ask if you felt that was um, uh, reasonable or if they were being you know, overcautious in terms of withholding information for that reason. Um, I think there's, there's two levels at which I'd answer the question. First of all, um, the consolidated accounts um, don't contain very much information about any of the support to private companies. It's contained as notes to the accounts. Um, but the Cabinet Secretary for Finance has uh, provided information to the Finance Committee uh, in more detail than what's included in the accounts in most circumstances. Um, I think there is a case for more transparency, not just about the loan support and other, other guarantees that are provided, um, but about the principles the government intends to use in making decisions about that support, the overall amount available, what factors it takes into account, what risk it's prepared to bear in doing it. Um, so I think there's a, there's a case for greater transparency in general. In relation to commercial sensitivity, I accept that there are circumstances um, where there may be a good argument for keeping information confidential for a short period of time, for example, while, while a significant negotiation is underway um, or while a significant contract is under procurement. Um, but again, I think that, should, that commercial sensitivity test should be applied sparingly um, and it should be time limited. Um, I think that um, that's something the government should be covering as part of its framework. Um, and I think uh, given the inevitable risks associated with that type of support um, and the fact that the government's appetite for providing it appears to be increasing over time, um, it's now important that Parliament does have that framework that lets it understand better what's happening in practice. So in terms of the <clears throat> uh, transparency about the principles um, and the framework, 
Um, is it right to say then you're making a specific recommendation to the Scottish Government that they produce a framework which outlines the criteria they will apply and um, the, the potential scale of support for, for private companies? Exactly. Right, so that's I a think. specific recommendation. Yes, I recommend that the framework uh, should be public and it should cover things like the capacity for providing support, um, the risk <coughs> appetite, the criteria they will use in assessing individual cases. Presumably you've not had a response to that recommendation yet because the reports, the accounts are new. I, I don't think we've yet had a response in the annual audit report process. I'll ask Stephen to pick that up. Thank you. Good morning. Um, we've had no... Um, confirmation yet that that forms part of um, the government's planned uh, response to the report. Um, so, you know, we'll continue to follow that through during the course of our audit work over the next few months. Right. Thanks. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Mayor. Um, maybe I can start by confessing my ignorance. Internal Audit Directorate, what's its remit? Provides the Internal Audit Service excuse me, to the Scottish Government and to a number of other public bodies who opt in to um, receiving their internal audit service in that way. Out of curiosity, what are these other public uh, bodies? There's a range of, of public bodies. Um, ones that come to mind, Mr Beattie, would be the Scottish Public Pensions Agency, Transport Scotland, um, Regist Registers of Scotland and so forth. It's a host of... Um, public bodies, many of whom, you know, the financial results are captured within the consolidated accounts for government. But clearly not NHS. No, they, you're right, they don't have a remit, um, they don't provide internal audit services to NHS boards, albeit they would cover the Scottish Government Health and Social Care Directorate as part of their work. Okay, looking at paragraph 46, I'm a bit alarmed that it says that uh, you found that uh, the Internal Audit Directorate doesn't comply with significant aspects of the standards. <coughs> and in the next paragraph, you're talking about significant improvements being required, audit planning, audit documentation, audit reporting, and management review. I mean, that's all pretty basic stuff. And you're saying, presumably, there's a deficiency there. I think, um, certainly, though, these are important matters, you know, and, and ones that we've uh, reported to the government, to its own governance um, arrangements. Um, and captured in this report too. Um, the, the scope of our work is um, under auditing standards and that requires us to look at the work of internal audit as something that external auditors would do um, routinely on, on an annual basis. Um, so yes, we did identify some deficiencies against the public sector internal audit standards, certainly not all of them, but the ones that we did identify, we thought you know, were material and, and requiring improvement. Um, I'm also pleased to see that the Scottish Government Internal Audit Directorate have taken this very seriously. They have invested in a, what they're terming a back-to-basics approach to ensure that you know, there, there is um, ongoing work to improve their arrangements. I think it's, it's probably worth um, mentioning, Mr Beattie, that you know, there's been a host of improvements and changes in the Internal Audit Directorate over a number of years um, you know, um, to, to transform the service. Um, and we have regular dialogue, and I think we are, you know, we are confident that the work that they're now doing will Im improve um, the provision and standards to, to where they want them to be. Is there a timescale for this? Yeah, very. Um, they gave an update to the uh, Scottish Government Audit uh, uh, Committee in September, and they're continuing to track that progress. For our own purposes, we'll pick that up uh, through our review of their work early in 2019. Again, out of interest, what is the reporting line for the Internal Audit Directorate? Um, the Director of Internal Audit reports to the uh, Director General for Scottish Exchequer uh, within the Scottish Government. They report the outcomes of their work to the audit committees that they provide services to. So for the Scottish Government, it would be to the Scottish Government Audit and Assurance Committee and to the range of other audit committees for other public bodies that they provide services to. Thank you. Willie Coffey. Jenny, um, uh, I wonder, Roger General, if you could say something a wee bit about the forecasting that we, we have to use. You've mentioned it in paragraph 28, and uh, I have, uh, for my sins, I serve also in the Finance Committee, and there we see huge variations really between the forecasts that come from the Fiscal Commission and the OBR, the Office of Budget Responsibility, which is a UK agency. Now, as I understand it, the Scottish Government is tied to using the forecasts that come from the 
fiscal commission, but we do see big differences between the two. Does that in itself present us with, with more difficulties in actually getting more accurate forecasts for the budget in years to come? Um, one of the starting points for my report to you this time is that the uh, Scottish Government's finances are becoming more complex and more volatile, more risky, um, to put it crudely, because of the um, new financial powers. Now, that would be the case anyway, because we're now reliant on taxes raised in Scotland that reflect the performance of the Scottish economy relative to the UK economy. Um, but the fiscal framework means that that volatility is even greater uh, because of the interaction between the uh, Fiscal Commission's forecasts of what's happening to the Scottish economy and Scottish taxes and the OBR's forecasts of the UK economy, which affect the block grant adjustment. And the way the two of those move can either um, reduce the impact on the Scottish budget or amplify it. Um, I produced a briefing on the um, risk in the Scottish budget um, a couple of weeks ago, which was sent to the Finance Committee for its interest and information. Um, but it's certainly one of the factors which mean that financial management for government, government is more difficult um, and which I think reinforce the importance of the um, recommendations I'm making in this report for things like uh, a consolidated public sector account and uh, clarity about the principles that will be used for the new borrowing powers as well as support to, fin to private companies. It certainly challenges members of the Finance Committee convener that we get such variation in the estimates and forecasting between the two bodies and uh, in, in relation to VAT, VAT assignment is coming soon. Uh, but as we understand that these are going to be based on surveys and estimates rather than any actual outturn data, which we understand is very difficult to gather in and is not recorded as Scottish in, in that sense. Does that present as any difficulty, you think, in constantly dealing with survey data to, to estimate VAT assignment? Um, I, I don't know any more than um, the Finance Committee does about the basis which will finally be agreed for um, apportioning VAT receipts to Scotland. Um, but I, I understand you're correct that it will be based on survey data, and that clearly brings with it its own risks that will need to be managed. Um, we'll be watching closely to see both what the agreement says and the way that's um, implemented in practice by the two governments. Mm -hmm. Last question, Jenny. You, me you also mentioned the the Common Agricultural Policy in paragraph 24, Auditor General, and you say that the value of that to Scotland is about £500 million. And I don't want to make any political points about it, but when do we need to know that that money's going to continue to come so that it works its way into the Scottish budget? What's the kind of time cycle for knowing that this will be made available? I think anybody um, making uh, firm predictions about the impact of EU withdrawal is on uh, dodgy ground at the moment. I'll ask Stephen to tell you where we are in terms of the, the current position. Um, probably not terribly much more to add other than the fact that um, we uh, conduct an audit of the uh, of Scotland's share of the, the UK uh, common agricultural policy. Um, we do that on an annual basis and that is scheduled to conclude um, in February. Um, of this year. Um, thereafter, um, as, as the Auditor General suggests, the, the uncertainty as to what will happen post-Brexit, whether there's any transitional period, will inevitably play into you know, the duration of that funding as it relates to, to Europe, and then whether it, and what happens to whether the, um, the funding comes from the UK or the Scottish Parliament thereafter. I only mean, is it, is it, does it have to be announced by a certain point in the year, for example, February every year or something like that, do we have to have an announcement of whatever the, the amount is by a fixed point in time so that it can start to work its way through the budget, or is it a bit more flexible than, than that? I, I think the budget will be based on assumptions that um, the uh, current uh, um, EU funding uh, period will continue in line with the assumption the, with the assurances from the UK government. Um, but what will happen in the event of, for example, a no deal uh, Brexit at the end of March um, or changes to the UK policy for the way that funding is allocated across the United Kingdom, I don't think any of us know. It's another element of uncertainty in the budget that will need to be managed. Thanks, Ella. Thank you. Thank you. I have a few more questions. I'd ask members to try and keep their questions tight and witnesses likewise, if that's OK. Bill Bowman, please. Yeah, I've just got a couple of questions on the financial statements, if I could. Simple one to begin with. Um, note 8 on inventories, £106 million 2017-18, £106 million 2016-17. Are these coincidentally the same? NHS inventories, it says. 
Can you give us a page number, Mr. Roman? 88. 88, thank you. I think the answer is yes. Exactly that, Mr. Bowman, is a, a coincidence. Um, just a little bit of context, as, as best as my memory uh, will serve me, is that it predominantly relates to theatre supplies and stock that individual hospitals hold. Um, it's subject to audit each year, and I think it's just that. It's not just the same stuff getting older. Uh, we're confident that, that it's, been, uh, it's been appropriately covered. Okay, and if you turn the page to 89. You mentioned that um, some of the comparative numbers have had to be restated, um, which, as I understand it, happens because either you change your accounting methodology, therefore to make it consistent, or because there's an error to be corrected. Are there any other restatements in the financial statements? I'll, I'll maybe <clears throat> do my best to, to start with that point. I think the note 9A, I think, gives an analysis of the loans that um, um, or non-current financial assets that the Scottish Government has across a, a range of categories from <clears throat> loans to Scottish Water to housing loans to the very specific one that the Government has sought to do in this note this year and a consequence of to restate is to provide more detail and more transparency on um, the, the loans to farmers uh, as a consequence of some of the challenges from the, the IT system. I think we think that's, that's welcome and appropriate to provide additional transparency um, in the financial, the financial statements. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if, uh, in terms of other restatements, well, I'll just check. Certainly, with the core financial statements, I'm not aware of any uh, restatements uh, off the top of my head, but we can double check that for you. We'll prepare page 36. <clears throat> so, yeah, so, so not within the core financial statements, but in relation to the First Minister's uh, benefit and kind of Butte House, there was a restatement uh, required to the 2016-17 figure. Um, that was as a result of an error identified by the Scottish Government in relation to the calculation of the benefit and kind that's provided for uh, accommodation at Butte House in Edinburgh. Um, the restatement was required um, because of, of uh, an error o uh, over a number of years um, and the Scottish Government picked this up in August uh, <coughs> last year and uh, held discussions with HMRC to arrange for a back payment of £16,765 to, to cover that. And as part of our discussions with the Scottish Government, we asked that the prior year figure should be restated to that, bring that into line with the current, current year's figure of uh, in, in 2017-18. And would that settlement figure be borne by the public purse or by the First Minister? It was the government took the decision uh, for the government to uh, meet it because it was an error in the civil servants' calculation of it. Which wouldn't change the fact that it's a personal liability of the First Ministers, so it their tax is being paid by the government. The, uh, the, re the adjustment of the benefit in kind for the use of Butte House, given the period over which it occurred and the uh, relatively small amount of the money involved, the government took the decision to fund it directly. Okay, well, I think we need to um, think about that further. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Auditor General, just on the borrowing that uh, you talked about in your opening statement, uh, you told us that the Scottish Government borrowed up to its limit this year uh, for capital funds to uh, 450 million uh, and overall the net borrowings are 1.036 billion. Uh, you said in the opening statement that there was no borrowing policy in place and I, I've, I've written down the word it needs to have one. Uh, can you clarify, sh should there be a borrowing policy put in place uh, do other jurisdictions have such a thing, and how imperative is there is it that there is a borrowing policy? Um, the, the new borrowing powers are a significant element of the financial powers uh, devolved under the Scotland Act 2016. Um, there is um, an overall £3 billion cap for borrowing, as you say, a £450 million a year annual limit, um, and the government has now net borrowing of £1.036 billion, so significant amounts of money. Um, I've made a couple of recommendations relating to uh, the new borrowing powers. The first, as you quite rightly say, is that I think there should be a statement of the policies and principles the government will apply in using those borrowing powers, um, both to guide its own decision making and to support parliamentary scrutiny of the budget um, and the uh, financial statements of the government. 
um, the uh, overall total of three billion is a relatively small amount of money, um, and it's important. I think the government is thinking over the long term about how it wants to use that to support its investment in uh, the assets and infrastructure for Scotland as a whole, um, and that it's making sure that it's drawing it down at the right time rather than incurring borrowing before it needs it with the associated interest costs that go with it. Um, other jurisdictions, other governments do have that. Um, I think it's a, a good part of uh, good financial management. And in many ways, it's close to the uh, prudential approach, which applies to local government borrowing, where councils are required to have um, a policy and a long-term plan for the way in which they will use their ability to borrow. So I, I think it's entirely consistent with good financial management. Thank you. So have you recommended this previously? Uh, and if so, when? And, and what's happened as a result? Um, I think from memory it was one of the recommendations in my report on the consolidated accounts last year as we knew the borrowing powers were coming along. Um, we don't yet have um, the publication of a policy and principles from government and it's something the committee may want to follow up with them. Um, I also think it's worth the committee noting that that borrowing doesn't appear on an audited account anywhere. The borrowing comes in and out through the consolidated fund, which is a cash account and doesn't have a statement of financial position or a balance sheet, as it's more commonly known. Um, it's not, it's not recognised on the balance sheet within the consolidated accounts. Um, and I think, again, for transparency, it would be a good move to, for the government to fulfil its commitment to having consolidated public sector accounts, which includes a balance sheet with all of its assets assets and liabilities. Thank you for that. That's, uh, that's very useful. Uh, just on that borrowing policy, do you get any sense of when it will be done, when it will be in place? Anything you want to add? It's under consideration um, by the government to, uh, as to how and when it will be developed. Much of that we expect will fall to the, um, the work of the new um, Directorate for, for Scottish Exchequer. Uh, to fulfil as part of its core responsibilities. Um, and like earlier answers, Mr Kerr, it's something that we're keeping a, a, a very close engagement with government on um, over the course of the next few months. Thank you. Thank you. Alec Neil. Uh, two questions, Auditor General. The first one is, even before the new borrowing powers, there was a limit of 5% uh, that uh, no more than 5% of the government's revenue could be used to fund repayments for borrowing PFI deals and all the rest of it. Um, can I ask, is that still the case? And if it is, is there a case now for reviewing that 5%? For example, if that was allowed to go up to 6%, it would allow a 20% increase in capital spend uh, in principle. Um, is that something that's still happening? The, uh, I'll ask Michael to come in in a moment. The 5% cap is still in place and it is um, one which the government has set for itself. It's not like the 450 million annual cap one, which is within the fiscal framework. Um, I think it's closely linked to the questions Mr Kerr was asking about a framework for borrowing. I think it's part of the overall capacity the government has for investment. And I'll ask Michael to update you on where we are with it. It was just really to say that, yes, it is, it is still in place. The medium-term uh, financial strategy or, or Scotland's fiscal outlook because, as it was called, it was published over the summer, but the Scottish Government outlines the projections and where they're at and, and plan to be against uh, that 5% limit. I think, if memory serves me right, it's, it's uh, close to the 4% at the moment. Um, as the Scottish Government borrows more through um, capital borrowing, so the, the £450 million that was referred to in the report for 17-18, We'll, we'll increase that uh, more towards the 5%, but obviously as repayments are made from, from borrowing previously, that will have the, the opposite effect as well. And as, uh, as we know from, and members will be aware from the 2018-19 budget, the Scottish Government plans to uh, borrow a further 450 million, which again would increase that pressure. There is some uh, changes to the status of, of, for example, regulatory asset-based funding for uh, rail projects that, that change the status of that and we still have to find out from the government how that will affect the 5% affordability so, cap. Obviously, as the government increases its revenue and last year they increased income tax, so revenue you would expect to go up, so is 5% of a higher figure uh, and, and gives you the ability, if you increase revenue sufficiently, uh, maybe to fund more than 5%. So would it be prudent uh, to look at that 5% figure as part of the review of and, and designing a new policy in the, for the new circumstances? 
I, th I think the, the Scottish Government, as they're uh, outlining a, a policy for borrowing, I think we'll look to the, at the 5% affordability cap. Uh, as a self-imposed cap, it, it has to be said, um, so it will be within their gift to, to raise it or lower it. And as you say, as, as total budget uh, increases or, or maybe decreases, that obviously affects the, the under, underlying amount behind the 5%. Okay. Can I go back just to follow up Briefly, on the, yeah, uh, Mr Coffey's questioning, because we've seen the issues around out getting our share of the EU agricultural money. But there's a wider question, wh whether it's next year or uh, the start of 2021, um, when we will stop paying our annual EU contribution uh, at current levels. It will obviously be substantially lower. Um, Spice have indicated that and if you take the existing gross figure, Scotland's share of EU contributions from the UK annually is about 1.6 billion. And if we funded, if we got that money and we funded every single EU programme that exists in Scotland right across the board, we would have £800 million a year left to spend on other things. Please now, please obviously, and one, once we know those figures, um, is there any work being done in looking at um, the impact when we're looking two or three years uh, ahead of getting our share of the EU-UK funding? I think that's the question you'd have to ask government. That's work that I imagine they would be undertaking. Um, it's not something that we've done any work on at this stage. Right. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I refer you to Exhibit 1, please, in your report, Auditor General, on page 6? is the total expenditure resource and capital. I just wanted to clarify where the um, local government spending comes. Is it under each portfolio headline? No, the main local government settlement is under the community social security and equalities line in the table there. So the money that's given to uh, local authorities that, that is then spent on education, is that under community, social security and equalities, or is it under education and skills? Most of it's within the settlement and is therefore under communities um, in the line that I just referred you to. Okay. Can I ask, on the education and skills budget line, it shows the largest underspend of any government department, but we understand from the First Minister that it's her number one priority. So this seems to me... A little strange. Is there any explanation that you have for such a large underspend? Yes, the um, accounts themselves actually include some information about them on pages 53 to 63, but I'll ask Stephen to talk you through the specifics of that line. Thank you. Um, page 55 of the consolidated accounts, um, they follow a similar format whereby all of the, the individual departments within the Scottish Government analyse their revenue and um, expenditure over the course of the year. Um, the set format can be noticed that any variance against budget that's over three million comes with an, an accompanying explanation. Um, specifically, there's a, there's a, there are a couple of um, explanations around the education department, one of which relates to the calculation of student loans, which is captured under that budget heading. And I'll just quick, quickly refer to um, my notes uh, in terms of the other uh, difference very briefly. Um, one is a, another one in terms of the lower than anticipated funding required by the Scottish Funding Council during the year. The detail of that and what lies underneath that is, is something we probably need to either come back to in writing um, or maybe for the committee to explore directly with the Scottish Government. Okay. I think I'd like to do both. Could you come back with more information in writing, Mr Boyle? Would that be okay? Thank you. Um, do members have any further questions on the consolidated accounts for the Auditor General and her team? Okay, before we close this uh, meeting, I'd like to put on record my thanks to Ian Gray, MSP, for his service on the Public Audit Committee. It's Ian's last meeting with us today. I'm very sorry to see him go and thank him for, um, for all his scrutiny. And I'll close this, this meeting of the Audit Committee.